Is Olive ready? She's as ready as she can be at the moment with her mouth full. <laughs> I tell her all the time not to talk with her mouth full, but she thinks it's funny these days. <laughs> Listen, Olive never stops talking, okay? <laughs> no, she really doesn't. <laughs> oh, hi, Kara. Hey, Megan. And hi, guys. Nobody's sick this week. Well, Kara is a little sick this week, Listen, but not too bad. Yeah, it's just like the weirdest thing, though. I don't know if it's just like allergies where it got really warm and then it got mm-hmm. really cold and now I'm stuffy and I have a little cough and then my voice goes in and out and I'm like, what is happening yeah. to me? Why? I think it's Why? the whole thing. It got to be 80 degrees and then it snowed this morning. So yeah, everything is ridiculous. Yeah. When I was picking up Willow, there were giant oh, snow flurries oh. everywhere and I was like, what is, why is this? Why is this a thing? I have this episode today that Uh I have put up on the Patreon for vote a few times, and it usually comes in second. Oh, dang. I really want to tell this story because it's wild. Yes. So we're doing it today on the regular feed. (laughs) Okay. It's a mystery. Okay. It could probably be filed under murder, except we can't prove anything. So we're just going to file it under mystery. Okay. Okay. Sounds good to me. And I'll probably say many times that uh, I have a lot of opinions. Allegedly. (laughs) Mm -hmm. we feel this way (laughs) exactly exactly uh do we have anything else to talk about uh i don't think so i don't think so either i think we're good yeah okay we are going back to september 11th 2001 (gasps) oh yeah the big big day where were you what were you i was here in lexington Mm -hmm. and i was at work Okay. At my very first, like, writing job. I was a communications assistant, and I got to write press releases and okay. articles. And it was, like, the first byline I ever got was this place. Oh. And everybody was at a meeting because mm-hmm. there was, like, a 9 o'clock meeting every Tuesday. Yep. And the phone rang, and it was the guy who did, like, all the women in the office had the same hairdresser. <laughs> and he he called. Oh. And it was so weird. Like I'm like, I wonder why he's the one that like his whole thought was right. like, I better call that office. I better call my ladies. Yeah. And he was like, have you seen the news? Do you know what's going on? And I was like, what? No, there's yeah. no, I don't watch TV at work. You know, right. he was like a plane flew into the world trade center and they thought it was an accident, but then a second one flew into it and they think it's a terrorist attack. And oh I was like, gosh. what? Yeah. I have a friend and we're still friends today. His name's Brett. And he was a Marine who worked at the Pentagon at the time. Oh, my gosh. And we went to high school together. We've known each other since we were really, really yeah. little. We used to, while he was at the Pentagon and I'd be at my job, we would email back and forth all day. Uh-huh. Like we treated email like an instant messenger, you know, because right, exactly. we couldn't have instant yes. messengers yes. on our work computer. <laughs> and I remember like I went, I went to the conference room where they were meeting and I told them about it. And there was a TV in there. They turned it on and I watched it for a minute. And I was like, I wonder if Brett knows about this. And so I go back to my office and I emailed Brett. And like, in hindsight, I'm like, of course he knew about it, Megan. He's right. a Marine. Like, exactly. <laughs> I'm sure they knew the second it happened. Yeah. I still remember sitting there. I went back to the conference room and I was like watching on TV and everybody else had left, like, I guess to go call people or something. Right. All of a sudden the TV, like the picture changed uh-huh. to just smoke. Yeah. And I remember the newscaster was like, I don't know what we're looking at right now. Yeah. Oh, okay. Oh, this is the Pentagon. Oh and I yes. lost it. Oh my God. Like my heart stopped. Yes. And I like, I ran back to my office and I'm emailing Brett and I'm calling Brett and he, of course he's not answering. Right. I didn't hear from him until like late that afternoon, oh. but he did finally get in touch with me. But I mean, the whole day I right. was just like, I have no idea Yeah. where he even was in the yeah. Pentagon. You right. Know? Exactly. Oh, it was crazy. Uh-huh. What about you? Where were you that uh, day? I was in drama class. <laughs> oh, yeah. Yeah, so we stopped That's right. everything. right. You would have been in high school. I was, yeah. We stopped everything and just sat in front of this tiny little TV that they brought into the room. And we just sat there uh-huh. all day, just in shock. Yeah. That's what, I mean, I think for the next several days I just spent in shock. I couldn't yeah. believe it. Yeah. Oof. So, okay. This story does take place. In New York. Okay. But it's in Spencer, New York. Okay. Which is about four hours away from New York City. Okay. Okay. Michelle Ann Harris was a server at a place called Lefties. And she was working that night and she finished up her shift and then she hung out a little while after work. She had a few drinks with a couple of her coworkers in the parking lot. Okay. And that seems like surprisingly normal to me for September 11th. Right. (laughs) Like... I don't know, like my whole world shut down that day. Exactly. And I guess I thought that that's, I thought that's what everybody did. Like yeah. Everybody just stopped. Yeah. But I mean, like her 
restaurant stayed open, you know? Yeah. And I'm like, I guess, I guess a lot of places did stay open. Not everything could shut down. Right, like I just exactly. had the luxury of yeah. being able to stop, but yeah. not everybody could. Yeah. Okay. So she finishes up having some drinks with her coworkers and then she goes to see her boyfriend. Okay. Now. Michelle is actually married, but she and her husband are going through a divorce. Gotcha. At this point, they do still live together. She shares a home with him and their four kids. Mm -hmm. But that's because the court has basically forced them to continue to share a home. Yeah. So she hangs out with her boyfriend for an hour or so, talks about everything that has happened that day. Yeah. And then she leaves her boyfriend's place and heads home around 11 o'clock at night. Okay. It's a school night and she has to get home to help her kids get up and off to school the next day. Right. The next morning at 7 a.m., Barb Thayer, she's the nanny to Michelle's children. She gets a phone call from Cal Harris, who is Michelle's estranged husband. And he's like, hey, Michelle didn't come home last night. Can you come over and come over? Come over. (laughs) Can you come over and help get the kids ready for school? Oh. Okay. So let's pause here and learn a little more about Cal and Michelle's relationship. Okay. Cal... Grew up real wealthy. His family owned a series of car dealerships. He was like a star lacrosse player, good looking guy. Everybody loved him. Just your bro. Right. And Michelle grew up like normal middle class life. Yeah. She worked as a secretary at one of the car dealerships that his family owned. And that's where they met in the late 1980s. Oh. And then they got married in 1990. And they lived on a 252 acre estate in Spencer, New York. Huh? I was like, how does that even exist? (laughs) You know, I have to visualize things. So like I looked it up and one acre is about the same size as an American football field. Jeez. 252 football fields. (laughs) Jeez. We have all together. We're on three acres over here and it's, it's not, I mean, it's big, but it's not that big, but thinking of that, like what, how these are not poor people. Right. Right. They seemed happily married for a long time. No Mm -hmm. one knew about any marital problems, but all of that changed after the birth of their fourth child. Okay. That's when Michelle confided in her sister-in-law that things weren't perfect at home. She said that Cal had a bad temper and he was super controlling and it was like everything had to be perfect. Right. He wanted her to be thin so she would lose weight for him, but to Michelle, nothing she did seemed to please Cal. Mm Mm-hmm. He said this thing. He said, you were born in, oh, I'm going to say this wrong. It's T-I-O-G-A. It's either Tioga or Tioga, but it's the, it's like, where she grew up. Right. He's like, you were born in Tioga Center, raised in Tioga Center, and you'll die in Tioga Center, which was basically saying, you know, like, you're a small town. You're beneath me. You're trailer I'm trash. better than you. Yeah. And I'm like, okay. Okay, bud. Ugh. You have to make a point to tell people that you're better than them. Right. You're not better than them. Yeah. Here's like a life advice. You don't have to go announce what you are to anybody. Yeah. Just go be what you are and And let everybody else figure it out. Don't judge others for being the way they are. Ugh, what a jerk. Yeah, I can't stand it. (laughs) And then Michelle discovered that Cal was having an affair with another clerk on one of his family's car lots. Fun. And he justified this by saying that Michelle wasn't keeping the house clean enough. Huh? I'm sorry. What? Yeah, let's just take a moment. You didn't clean the floors today, so I'm going to go sleep with Sally. Mm-hmm. Okay. Well, you see how that one leads to the other, right? Right, I mean, right, right, right. Yep, yep. It's just logic. Kayla. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, he said he would end the affair, and then he did not. Well, of course not. Hmm. Hmm. He's a busy guy on his acreage. <laughs> All his acreage. Michelle stopped sharing a bed with her husband in 2000, choosing to sleep on the couch instead. And then she met a guy named Brian Early, who he was a younger guy visiting from Philadelphia. Brian and Michelle began their own relationship. And at the beginning of 2001, Michelle filed for divorce. Okay. Now, one might argue that things are already fairly ugly. Right. But this is when things get downright hideous. Yes. So Cal repeatedly tells Michelle, I'm not going to let you divorce me. Oh. Which is a weird move. Like, I'm not going to let you. Right. I'd rather stay married in this miserable relationship than get a divorce. Like, and what? see you what? be happy with yourself. So he goes to Michelle's family and he's like, you have to talk her out of this. What? She's just being influenced by these people she works with. Ugh. I think she might even be doing drugs. <laughs> huh? If she doesn't want to be married to me, 
you know, the guy who makes her feel like crap about herself, then clearly she's on something. Last week, she forgot to fold the laundry and I slept with Joanne in marketing. And you know how she, I'm better than she is. Right, right, I mean, right. I just, she's a small town girl. Why would she got, not want to be married I've got to all me? this acreage. <laughs> <laughs> so the nanny said she also overheard lots of super loud arguments. Mm. And Michelle told her sisters in March of 2001 that Cal had said, I wouldn't even need a gun to kill you and police oh. will never find your body. Wow. I know. Can you imagine? But hey, nanny. Someone saying that to you. Her body's gone. I mean. What? I just can't. I can't even imagine in the worst argument someone saying to me, I don't even need a gun gun to kill you. you." Wow. He also, um, she was on the phone with him in July of 2001 while she was at getting her hair done. And she put it on speakerphone and let her hairdresser hear. And he threatened to kill her and make her disappear. (gasps) But that was nice. It was good because the hairdresser heard it. Yeah. So now they're a witness. Yeah. Oh, my gosh. Uh, One time this has nothing to do with the story but this is me and my adhd but one time <laughs> i had a brow client i think she was a brow client brow brow or lashes whatever but she was laying on the table and she kept being like listen uh the baby's with her dad like i've got to answer the phone if he calls and he kept calling and she's like i've got to answer it maybe something's wrong and her eyes were closed and she couldn't open them so oh she had to have been doing lashes but she couldn't open them so she was like can you please hit answer on this and just put it on speakerphone and i was Mm. like sure and he starts (sighs) screaming at her i knew you weren't at your appointment I've poured coffee all over your car, blah, 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 blah. I was like, what? And then he's like, I'm FaceTiming you to see where you are. And she was like, can you click accept? And I was like, heck no, I'm not clicking accept. (laughs) So then she like opens her eyes and clicks accept. And he's like, oh, yeah, I hope he felt like an idiot. We'll talk when you get home. But one, how much coffee did you waste? I hope it was like Folgers from your coffee pot that you poured all over her car. Whose car did he pour it on? Like. Right. Wasn't her exactly. car at your place? Yeah, yeah. So, I don't know. Oh Poor God. people with coffee stains on their car now. Like, what Good is wrong Lord. with him? Yeah, so that's... People are crazy. Anyways, tangent over. You know what? You don't have to stay in relationships you're miserable in. Right. You all have my permission to not stay in relationships you're miserable and in. And don't pour coffee on people's cars. <laughs> Those are two very important pieces of advice. Don't kill them with cakes. Don't... <laughs> Even Olive laughed at that. She did. She thought it was funny. Mom oh, jokes. <laughs> okay, so Cal's net worth was estimated at five point four million dollars. And in June, Cal was ordered to pay Michelle four hundred dollars a month, along with all the expenses related to the house. I think that was supposed to be four thousand dollars a month. I hope so. Yes. I was about to say, how was she supposed <laughs> I think to I pay got for a zero wrong <laughs> food and stuff for the kids? And then he was supposed to do that until the divorce was final. Okay. He was also ordered to give all his guns to his brothers and his dad until the divorce was over and Michelle had moved out. And Cal offered Michelle full custody of the kids and a settlement of $740,000 over the next 10 years, but she said no. Oh. So also in June of 2001... Brian Early, her boyfriend, he moved to nearby oh, uh, Tioga, Tioga, whatever. He did. He planned to marry her soon after she divorced. Oh, so they had these plans. Now, Michelle, on the other hand, she wasn't sure that she was going to marry Brian, but she did want to have a long-term relationship right. with him. And I imagine like, that had to do with the fact that she's just getting out of this okay, awful Okay, well, that's what I was right? going to say. Like, she's just like, listen, I just got out of this and I don't want to crawl back into it. So let's just take it easy for a bit. Right. I'm not going to jump back into getting married. Right. But he's a lot younger than her. I think he's in his 20s. Oh, and so, so it's he's like, like eager. He's ready to get married. Yeah. yeah. So Michelle also had a romantic relationship at one point with one of her managers at work. Now, by this time that she disappears, it's over. Okay. But no one had known about this one. Okay. And this is at the work that ex-husband's family... No. This is at the restaurant where she works. Okay. Yeah. I wasn't sure how long ago it was. Yeah. Okay. And then he was one of the coworkers that she shared drinks with that night. Okay. After work. Okay. And then also, she sometimes made out with another employee of the Harris Family Dealerships. Oh. And she was linked to a man from Texas, oh. but we don't know much about okay. that one. Well, you do you, so babe. You do you. She is 
She's living her life. Yeah. In August, Cal offered Michelle $80,000 a year in alimony and child support, along with custody of the children. And she eventually decided that she was going to accept that offer, although she hadn't told Cal about this yet. Okay. She was scheduled to meet with her lawyer on September 12th, 2001. Oh. She was also planning a trip to New York City during that second weekend of September to sell or pawn some of her jewelry, including her engagement ring, so that she could come up with her half of a down payment on a home that she and Brian were going to buy. Can you imagine going to pawn your engagement ring and getting half of a down payment for a home? (laughs) I had that thought, too. I was like, wow. (laughs) But I mean, so you can tell, like, she is planning a future with Brian, you know? Yeah. She'd also accumulated... A significant amount of debt on her credit card and bounce some checks. Okay. So I'm sure she planned to use some of the money to take care of that. Right. Too, right. That she got from selling yeah. the jewelry. Okay. So now we're back to September 12th, 2001. Cal has called the nanny, Barbara, because Michelle didn't come home that uh-huh. night before. So Barbara heads that way. When she gets there, she sees Michelle's minivan parked on the road by the Harris's driveway. Oh. Now, remember, this isn't. A house. This is an estate. Yeah. The driveway is a quarter mile long. It's like five acres. (laughs) And it, yeah, it curves through fields and woods. So you can't see the road from the house. So it's not like one of our houses where you look out the window and you see the car park. And then your neighbor's house as well. Yeah. Barbara gets out. She checks out Michelle's van. The doors are unlocked and the keys are still in the ignition. So now she's thinking, oh, well, maybe Michelle has gotten home yeah. in a few minutes since Cal called me. Yeah. Maybe she had car trouble and she left her car here. She walked to the house. So Barb goes on to the house. But when she gets there, it's just Cal and the kids. Okay. And she's like, Michelle's car is on the road. And Cal goes, oh, we better go get it. What? That's a little weird to me. Like if that's. And that's I don't your know, response. Right? It, but it, like, is that the entirety of the exchange? Yeah. Maybe there was more said, but you would yeah. think his response would have been like confusion. Like, what? why? Her car's here. Yeah, Where is she, she then? Come. Why isn't she here? Yeah, she's not. Right. I haven't seen her walk through the door. So Cal and Barb go get Michelle's car. And Barb is like, since her car's here, maybe Michelle's nearby. Like, maybe she's hurt. Maybe something happened to her. Or maybe she's looking for baby cows in the field. That's what I'd be doing. Yeah. And Cal is like, no, she's going to go to New York today. That's where she is. Oh. And Barb's like, without her car? Yeah, how'd she get there? And he's like, well, she probably hitchhiked. What are you talking about? Huh? What do you mean she probably hitchhiked? She has a car. She's, what? But her it's car happening. is right here, and you're, you're getting it. And why would she not have come home, gotten the kids off to school, and then gone to New York? Like, what are you doing? What mother of four is going? I don't, I mean, you do you. Whoever's listening and you were like, I would do this. But what mother of four is going to hitchhike in the morning? Don't hitchhike. Just don't. Late at I'm night. not even going to say you do you. Don't hitchhike. That's right. how people yeah, get murdered. No. No. <laughs> he also pointed out all this stuff in the car, like clothing, mail, toys, food wrappers. And he's like, man, I'm going to have to get this car clean. What? Yeah. He's going to so, get it detailed? I, I don't know. I don't know how far it went. But he did own car dealerships. So I'm sure he could easily get that done. Uh-huh. Allegedly. Barb goes on to the house and Cal leaves her work. And then Barb calls a friend of Michelle's to see if that friend had heard from Michelle. And that friend then calls Michelle's divorce lawyer because she knew that Michelle had an appointment with her lawyer that day. Oh, smart. So when her lawyer finds out that she hadn't come home and that calls to her cell phone were going unanswered, he calls the police and reports the 35-year-old woman missing. Oh, So her lawyer reported her missing, not her husband. Right. Now, remember, it's September 12th, 2001. So the state police have a lot of people missing. Right. They're all being sent to New York City to help. So many of the the department's search dogs and aviation had also been sent to lower Manhattan. But still, there were two investigators still in town, and they went to visit Cal at work at the car dealership. He went with the investigators back to his house, and he gave them permission to search. He said they're welcome to take the minivan if they needed to, but that he would want it back. Okay. He also casually mentioned that maybe Michelle had been using cocaine. What the heck? Which I'm just like, what? Where? <laughs> and Why? Then he went back to work. I don't know. <laughs> and I don't. I never hear anything that like backs up. That. Oh, by the way, I she's mean, a drug addict. I don't addict. know if that's true or not. <laughs> but I mean. You know, maybe she did start experimenting with drugs. I have no idea. Who knows? I never hear anything that confirms or denies that. So I don't know. 
but it doesn't like nobody seems to talk about that at all. So I don't yeah. think it's a thing. Just a little knows. nugget of info that he yeah. only knows. Police searched the Harris estate with helicopters and dogs, and they even got divers and sonar involved to check okay. out this little pond near the driveway. Oh, okay. And there's also a 29 acre lake called Empire Lake that borders the east side of the Harris property, Jeez. and they search that. Okay. They find nothing. Wow. They went to speak to the staff at Lefties to find out about the last shift that Michelle had worked. Uh huh. And they talked to the two co workers that she'd shared the drinks with in the parking lot that on the night of September 11th. Yeah. Turns out one of those guys had a history of cocaine use oh. and had previously been convicted of assaulting a former girlfriend. Oh. And the other one had served 10 years in prison for rape. <laughs> oh, wow. Right. I mean, that well, one got me too. I was like, dang, dude. So uh, there's that. Note to self vet the uh, coffee shop future employees. Exactly. I was like, oh, wow. I wonder if she knew. Yeah. That. They both took and passed lie detector tests and were cleared as suspects. Okay. Next, police questioned Brian Airly. It's E A R L E Y. Yeah, Airly, sure. Airly. Yeah. You know what? Both are right. They're both right. They're both right. <laughs> both are right. <laughs> you did it. He consented to them searching his apartment as well as his family's hunting cabin. Okay. And he also took and passed a lie detector test and was cleared huh. as a suspect. Okay. Which brings us back to Cal. Right. He had motive. Right. Obviously, the financial settlement, invo- settlement involved in his divorce. Has made multiple comments about it. Yeah. There was also some physical evidence. A forensics investigator found what appeared to be red blood spatter on the wall in the garage. Oh. He found it three days after Michelle vanished, and he saw more on the doorway to the house. Huh. So this got them a search warrant, and they found similar stains in the foyer in the kitchen. Okay. They did tests, and they determined that this was human blood. Oh. And then when they did DNA tests, it proved that it belonged to either Michelle or a member of her immediate family. Oh. The forensics investigators also thought that there were signs that more blood had been there but had been cleaned up. Okay. And police considered the house to be a crime scene. Oh. Now, Michelle's sisters, they knew all about those threats that Cal had made, right? Uh So they confront him about the thing he'd said about killing her and how police would never find her body. Right. And they also brought up this incident from 1996 when Michelle had called her sisters from inside a closet (gasps) where she was hiding. Oh, no. While Cal was outside the closet repeatedly, like, cocking his shotgun. What? Right. What a crazy... Cal initially denied that any of this happened Mm -hmm. and then finally admitted that he had made the threats, but that he wasn't serious. Because you know how death threats are funny. You just, you're just kidding. It's jokes. I didn't mean it. It's just jokes. You know how that is. Dad jokes, gosh. Hilarious. Yeah. (laughs) That's how we play around. We're all too poor to get his humor is the problem. Right, right, right. Yeah. All that acreage. (laughs) Cal didn't have an explanation for the bloodstains at the house when he was first asked about them. He didn't. Hmm. But then later he was like, well, Michelle cut herself in the garage a month before she disappeared. Like real bad. Mm-hmm. Huh. Police searched Cal's truck and all-terrain vehicle and they thoroughly examined Michelle's car. They found her cell phone in her car, but there wasn't anything useful in it. Okay. And they also found a black bag containing her jewelry because remember she had been planning to take it. To right. Sell. She's going to pawn it. Yeah. They also found Cal's fingerprints as well as Brian's. So no surprises there. Mm-hmm. And they found one more set of fingerprints to an unidentified person. Oh. And it's also not Michelle. Yeah. But what they didn't find was a body. Correct. And so we know how that goes. Mm Mm-hmm. Police were pretty convinced that Cal had murdered his wife and disposed of her body, but they didn't have enough to convict him. Ugh. So aside from the threats, a lot of the suspicion around Cal had to do with his behavior after Michelle disappeared. Like... You know, he didn't even stay home from work that day. Right. (laughs) And he didn't even try to call Michelle to see where she was. Yeah. He didn't join in any of the search parties. He didn't ask Michelle's friends if they heard from her. Yeah, he's got a lot going on. He was really cooperative with police, but he didn't, like, push the police to do anything to find her, you know? Okay, yeah. And he never called, like, Michelle's dad after the disappearance. It's like, oh, she's not here. Huh. And he does nothing. Oh, that's strange. One of the investigators was like, if the mother of your children who takes care of them every morning suddenly doesn't show up, 
I think your first reaction is going to be to pick up the phone and make a call right. and be like, where the hell are you? Yeah, you probably want to question that. Right. Also, Cal's calmness in general was weird because it wasn't like him. The nanny said that Cal was this, he had an explosive temper, which I mean, remember the shotgun thing? Like, obviously. Right. He wasn't calm, cool, and collected about anything. But the morning that Michelle disappeared, he was like super chill. Right. Then in 2005, investigators decided that some of the threats Cal had made were close enough to the time Michelle disappeared that they decided they think they can get a conviction even without a body. Oh. So Cal was indicted on one count of second-degree murder. Okay. Okay. So before this could go to trial, that indictment got dismissed because a judge ruled that most of the testimony that led to the indictment was, like, inadmissible evidence, like opinions and hearsay. Oh, what? So then a month later, a new grand jury indicts Cal again, and this time it goes to trial. Oh, okay. (laughs) He probably was like, yes. Yeah. Well, the other thing is, remember, Cal is really wealthy and really well-known in this town. Right. And he's like the oh, lacrosse yeah. hero, good-looking guy. Yeah. Everybody liked him. You yeah. Know? It goes to trial. The case was circumstantial since there was no body and no weapon. The prosecution argued that Cal had killed Michelle in their home sometime after 11.30 p.m. on September 11, 2001, and then disposed of her body at an unknown location. Oh my gosh. Some of the more damning testimony... Barbara, the nanny, she continued to work for Cal for a year after Michelle disappeared. Oh. And she said that in the weeks after the disappearance, Cal talked about having a garage sale to get rid of Michelle's things. What? One of Cal's employees testified that Cal had asked him to clean his truck inside and out when he came into work on September 12th. Oh. A blood splatter expert, Henry Lee, I think he's the famous one, right? Like, I think he's the one from the staircase. Maybe. He said that the blood splatter stains observed in the home didn't look old enough to have been there for a month, like Cal said. And where was it on the, you said it was near the door or on the door? It was like on the garage, in the garage, like leading into the house. And then they also found it like in the foyer and in the kitchen. But he said, even though it didn't look old enough to have been there a month, he also couldn't really determine exactly how old the blood was. Well, I was going to say, with obsessive as this guy is with keeping the house clean, you would think there'd be no blood. Right. Like if like her keeping the house clean, you think if she hurt herself, she'd clean up after herself. Well, but she wasn't keeping the house clean, Karen. Oh, That's yeah, why it was okay yeah, for him to yeah. cheat on So it. he had to clean his house. Right. <laughs> <laughs> but on the other hand, <laughs> Cal had co- cooperated fully with the police. When investigators showed up at the Harris home the first time, they didn't see or smell anything to indicate a cleanup had just taken place. Oh, gotcha. And then it turns out that some of those blood splatters were genuinely old. Oh. And there were only, like, ten total. So it wasn't like there was blood. Gotcha. Oh, I thought there were, like, smears of it. Right. Okay. And then there was also, um, there's, like, some debate over whether Cal or the nanny suggested the whole garage sale. Like, Cal oh. says that was the nanny's idea. And the nanny okay. denies this. So, who knows? Gotcha. The jury found Cal guilty. Oh, But we are so not finished with this story. Okay. The day after Cal was convicted, Uh a guy named Kevin Tubbs opens the newspaper, sees a picture of Michelle on the front page. Now, Kevin is a farmhand and he lived near the Harris's. Okay. So he sees Michelle and he comes forward and he's like, listen, I I saw her on the morning of September 12th, 2001 on the road next to the Harris's driveway. What? Along with another vehicle a black or a dark blue Chevrolet pickup truck. And in the truck, there was a man arguing with Michelle. Oh. Listen, are you telling me this woman disappeared and has been missing and there's been all these search parties and this is the first time that Kevin Tubbs has seen a photograph of her? Oh, that's true. Mr. Tubbs, what what kind of vehicle are you driving? So here's his story. Okay. Kevin Tubbs had gotten up at about 5.30 a.m. that day It was still dark outside, except in the east where the sun's coming up. He's pulling a hay wagon along the road, and his truck brakes weren't great, so he's driving really slow. Right, right. And it's like a narrow road, so he has to really go slow around the cars. And he thinks he saw Michelle and this unidentified man at about 5.45 a.m. Huh. It's not quite as dark, but dark enough that he's using his headlights. Okay. Obviously, if there's an eyewitness... (laughs) <laughs> oh, no. Okay. I would. <laughs> like, not aliens this time. No, okay. Okay. 
If there's an eyewitness that says he saw Michelle on the morning of September 12th, then Cal couldn't have murdered Michelle in the home overnight. Right. And this introduces the possibility of other suspects. Oh, no. Cal's defense team files a motion to dismiss the verdict, and it was granted. Okay. So he was guilty, and then it was overturned. Obviously, the prosecution appeals that, Mm -hmm. and the appeal was later granted. So now it's going to go to trial again. And now it's questionable. Okay. In November 2007, another man, his name's John Steele, he wrote a letter to the court saying, I also saw a man and a woman arguing next to two vehicles as he drove past the Harris home. He said he heard the man say, just get in the damn car. Oh. John Steele died about a year later, so his testimony was ruled as inadmissible hearsay. Right. But again, this story, it is 2007. This happened in 2001. You're telling me that this is the first time you've heard about this and you've decided to get involved? Right. I was going to say, this is the first time this crossed your mind. She's been missing this whole time and it didn't occur to you to say something? Hmm. So now Cal goes to trial a second time with a different judge from a different county. The prosecution presented mostly the same case as it had in the first trial, but this time the defense calls both Cal and Kevin Tubbs to the stand. Okay. Now remember, they couldn't call John Steele because he had died, but they Uh did call his son to testify. Okay. And here's it. His son goes, my dad didn't always tell the truth. (gasps) Oh. And he also said his dad had thought that Cal was guilty, that that Michelle had deserved it due to her extramarital relationships. I'm sorry, what? (laughs) It's okay that he killed her. It's I mean, he probably killed her, but it's all right. It's fine. She Mm. was doing sinful things. And so was he. And they were not, they were getting divorced. I just, yeah. Right. The prosecution also went after Kevin Tubbs' account, saying that it was too dim outside for him to have seen Michelle closely enough to recognize her from a picture in the paper four years after the fact, which I agree. Right. The jury found Cal guilty again, and he was sentenced to 25 years to life in prison. What? We're still not done. Oh. oh. (laughs) Not not done. No. Not near it. Okay. Okay. Cal appeals. Oh, my gosh. And there's a lot of really complex lawyer talk about procedures and evidence, whatever. It comes down to this. There had been a juror at that trial who had admitted that she had a slight opinion on the case. But we don't know what that opinion was. We just know she had an opinion before it started, right? Yep. So the defense had asked for the juror to be removed, and that was denied. So the verdict ends up getting thrown out, and they have another trial. What? (laughs) In a new county, 125 miles away. Third trial, Kara. I'm so, He's already been found guilty twice. Twice, yeah. How? Why? What are we At doing? At the third trial, the defense argued that the state police had focused so much on Cal that they had ignored other suspects, and okay. then they introduced a new suspect. What? And this is where I am like, oh no. I actually... <gasps> Do have questions about you this have, now. It's questionable. I was so convinced oh. it was Cal. Okay. Oh, this new suspect's name is Stacy Stewart. He is the guy from Texas that I mentioned back at the beginning. Remember, uh-huh. I said she was yeah. linked to this guy. We don't know much about yes. him. Yeah. He'd come to the area to work at the new steel plant. And Michelle's co workers, a lefty, said that Stacy came in there regularly and that Michelle had once given him a ride. Okay. One of Stacy's ex girlfriends testified that Stacy had told her he'd murdered someone, that he'd had past involvement with the Ku Klux Klan. What? That he was the last person to see Michelle alive, and that he said he'd known how to hide a body. Okay. The thing is, the reason this testimony all came from his ex-girlfriend is because at this point, Stacy had returned to Texas and they couldn't find him. <laughs> oh. Which is fascinating to me. Wow. Adding more credence to this theory, Kevin Tubbs saw a photograph of Stacey Stewart. He's like, yep, that's the man I saw arguing with Michelle that morning. Hmm. And the defense determined that at the time, Stacey Stewart was driving a truck that matched the description of the truck Kevin had seen. Oh, wow. (laughs) Mm -hmm. Wow. The prosecution had basically the same circumstantial case as always and just kept arguing that it was too dim for Kevin to be so sure of what he'd seen. Okay. Now, this time, the jury couldn't reach a verdict, and this ended in mistrial. Oh, my gosh. 
So now we have trial number four in March of 2016, 15 years after Michelle disappeared. Poor thing. This time, the prosecution had something new. Oh. Testimony from this guy named Gregory Farr, who's a convicted murderer, mm. who had been incarcerated along with Cal between the second and third trials. Okay. And he had allegedly heard Cal threaten another prisoner saying, I'll make you disappear like I made my wife disappear. Oh. And then, mid-testimony, Gregory Farr suddenly invoked his Fifth Amendment rights and refused to answer any more questions. Are you serious? <laughs> I'm just like, guys, guys, what? what's happening? Why is this happening? The defense still hadn't located Stacey Stewart, although they'd heard that maybe he was in Arkansas. They did mention another guy, though, David Thomason, who was a friend of Stacey Stewart. I have to say Stacey Stewart. I cannot just say Stacey, and I don't know why. <laughs> Stacey Stewart. It's like a compulsion. Yes. Yeah. It's just such nice alliteration. Yeah, I like it. So David Thomason, he was in jail, and he said that he, if he was forced to take the stand, he would plead the fifth. Oh, my gosh. He's a friend of Stacy's, and he will not testify. He said, I, but, I ain't no snitch. Right. But David's wife testifies. Oh. And she testified that David had told her that he, Michelle, and Stacy went out to a bar that night. And when he left, Stacy and Michelle were still there together. Oh. When David heard that Michelle had vanished, he assumed Stacy had killed her and buried her in concrete <gasps> somewhere, which I'm like, what, what a wild, you just from? jump right to that yeah. assumption. Okay. Well, <laughs> concrete. Another woman who knew both David and Stacy said that David had told her he'd been suspected of murdering a woman in New York, but they weren't worried about it anymore since Cal had been convicted. Oh, my God. Stacy Stewart and David Thomason had both abruptly left the area and returned to Texas shortly after Michelle disappeared. Stacy had even just recently bought a house, mm -hmm. and he left in such a hurry that he'd never made the first payment on it. What? Right. Wow. The defense tracked down Stewart's truck and found bloodstains on the back seat and the door panels, as well as some earrings that Cal said were similar to earrings that he'd bought for Michelle. Ooh. There were also apparently reports that Stacy Stewart had been seen burning bloodied clothing after Michelle vanished. The defense found this burn pit, excavated it, and found a bra <gasps> strap, some dark blue and beige cloth, a fancy button, and other items that the defense argued were consistent with Michelle's clothing and possessions around the time of her disappearance. Ooh. This time, Cal was found not guilty. Okay. <laughs> Michelle's family remains convinced that Cal killed her. Cal and Michelle's four children support their father and do not have much interaction with Michelle's family. Okay. That's it. What? I was just gonna, I'm just like, I'm just, it's what? A lot of what? <laughs> right. So... That was sent to us by Pamela. She's the one who suggested this story. She's also the one that suggested the hellish Nell, Nell Duncan, who I covered her oh, yeah. episode two. Yes. Well, thanks, Pamela. She sent it. I mean, it's really like, there's still so many things yeah. I think are weird, though. There's like, so many questions. Cal's behavior, when he found out she was missing, yeah. is super weird. So weird. But also, maybe he just hated her so much, he did not care. Okay, well, are his car lots fronts for something else? <laughs> I don't know. <laughs> You'd also think just for the sake of his kids that he would care. Right. No matter yeah. how much he hated her. Yeah. You'd be like, I need to figure out what happened to my kid's mom. Yeah, exactly. And the other thing is, who knows if this whole Stacey Stewart thing was a, com I mean, yeah, not a complete fabrication by the defense, yeah. but like, they don't really have to prove it. Exactly. It's not, it's not on them to prove that that's true. Yeah. They just, it does introduce doubt. It gives me doubt. Right. I was fully convinced it was Cal. Right. They're just, yeah, and they're just they trying to put that, that down like, in the jury's oh, mind. Yeah. Yeah. I still think it's weird that nobody came forward to say they saw her. Until later. That night, until after the yeah. first trial. Yeah. Like, come on. Yeah. But if the police were so focused on him and only him, uh -huh. maybe they just didn't really ask a lot of questions of anybody else. Yeah, that's true. And we still have no idea. Of course, no one's gone. No one's been uh, convicted of her murder. Oh, my gosh. Yeah. And they've still never found her body. That's crazy. Oof. So that's that. Jeez, well, thanks. You're welcome. <laughs> Anytime. <laughs> just if you want to be really frustrated. I mean, that's just a case that's really going to bother me because it's just like, oh, my God. Yeah, no, that's what I was literally just thinking. Like, I have so many questions. What? I would love some discussion in the Facebook group about it. It's a good yeah, one. Me too. 
I mean, it's a terrible story, but it's one. It's a good one to discuss. Right. I it's think it's a doozy. It's a yeah. good lesson in how you can get really focused on one suspect. Oh yeah, for sure. And get tunnel vision, you know. Mm-hmm. And I'm not saying that means Cal did or didn't do it, but like, right. You know, it's it's a look at all good the pieces. Yeah. Right. Okay, that's all. Wow, jeez. We'll be back next week with more episodes, you guys. Yeah. Okay, we love you so much. Goodbye. Goodbye.